that's supposed to be here. Um, so you've got a copy of the syllabus and you have a copy of the um, schedule um, of the topics. So let me, you can read through the syllabus. Um, and so what we're going to do uh, this semester, second semester organic is, is basically a continuation of the second half of the first semester of organic. So we've gone through our, you know, R&S, we've gone through our stereochemistry, and now we're learning reactions. And so this semester is going to be all reactions. Okay. So if you found that challenging, it's, it's going to continue. So what we're going to do this, what we're going to do in this class is in the, on the Canvas site, you will see that um, there's a lot of materials here. You know, you can, you can use the appointment scheduler to schedule an appointment. Um, and then each day is going to have the reading assignment. So what I've done is I've given you the top hat, the reading assignment for the top hat textbook for broken down each day along with then the corresponding problems in the chapter for that so that you can keep track of which problems you've done. So what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you before each class period to go through those sections that are listed there before you come to class. So we're going to go to a, we're going to move to a flipped what's called a flipped lecture period. Now, if there's something that you don't quite get as you're, you know, reading through that, you want to make a list of questions so that when we start class, I can go through and lecture and answer those questions. Um, but you have to make that list. So, and I'll probably um, start giving you problems. If you don't ask anything, then I'll probably start giving you problems and we'll see how far it goes. Um, so we're going to do a lot more problems this semester and we'll do as much lecture as you need. But, you know, you got to tell me, okay, I didn't understand this or this didn't make sense. Now, along the lines of reading the textbook, I'm also going to um, link on the pages as much as possible because this book doesn't quite match up with the book that we used when, when, um, when I've gone fully flipped lecture in the past. Is there'll be, for instance, if you look at tomorrow, what for tomorrow, the reading assignment is here for tomorrow. It's going to be um, the remaining reactions of alkenes along with um, starting alkynes. And so what you'll see is there are videos here um, that correspond to each one of those sections in the, in the reading. So you can watch the video, you can read the book, you can do both, whatever works best for you. But if you want to watch the video, you can click on it. For instance, the alkene hydrogenation, if you click on that, it'll come up with a topic, and then in the notes section below it, it will have timestamps as to where to go for each of those sections. So if you just wanted to look, for instance, at ozonolysis, it'll tell you how far to go in the video, and then that section is on ozonolysis. So they're not... It's in the it's in the tag it's in the um, description section, so I've got to code all of my videos and I'll be doing that at least at least one day in advance. If you're looking at Wednesday, you might see on at Wednesday you'll see um, that there is a pre lecture video, but it has a date there. That date will disappear and it'll be more descriptive when I when I do that today. And then these practice problem sets, we should probably get rid of the answer keys. Because if I do those, because I may bring those in and we may do some of those in class. So that way you have to do them as opposed to just looking up the answer key online. So um, that's going to be the way. So, it's, so that, le that lecture topic schedule is going to be pretty much the way we're going to go. And it averages about 
and eight. It averages like 18 sections. Now, some sections are big, some, some sections are small. So it averages that. So that's going to be our sort of our today. This week, it's going to be I'm going to lecture on the first part because you didn't have a chance to pre watch. But you could go back for today. Um, there's some of this is some of this is down in these videos, but I'll put the video links if you want to go back and watch them. But I'm going to lecture today and I'm going to lecture every half of Monday because the way I have it set up is we're going to have four exams. Um, so we're going to have exams on Monday for the first half of the class period for the first hour. And then I will lecture the second half and it defeats the purpose of having you like read ahead when it's not going to be on the exam when you should be studying for the exam. So you won't have to, on Mondays, you won't have to do a reading ahead of time. I'll lecture there on problems and ask questions. So we're going to, so we're going to use that flipped, that flipped because um, that's going to make it more active on your part. But again, if there's something that doesn't make sense, that's where you have to ask questions. Or if you had difficulties with a problem in the book, um, then you can ask, then you can ask about that as well. And I do have some multiple choice problems that I may that I may release as we go along. For instance, there is actually an online quiz that I what I, the way I used used to do this, but I think it's too much over the summertime. Is students would read, they would watch the video, and then they would answer these multiple choice questions. Um, so I'll pull these multiple choice questions out to maybe ask you at the beginning of class or in class. Okay. So you're going to have to you're going to have to budget your time in order to be able to watch or watch the video or read the book or both doesn't matter to me whatever is most effective for you um, before you come to class and also again take notes and write down questions so that when we start class if there's any questions the other thing we would do be doing much more of is at the beginning of class I will give you a short quiz on the previous classes material because we're going to be learning sometimes well if we got two hours and 15 minutes we might be learning as many as like 10 different 10 new reactions a day and so it's important to that those get under control so we will have a lot more quizzes at the beginning of class but it'll be on the previous material yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you either by me or by email saying tomorrow we'll start with a quiz over these topics so that you know what to prepare for. And if you're into three by five cards, you might want to get a few because there's going to be a lot of reactions we're going to do and you might want to make three by five cards in order to start learning the reactions. And I'll, I can, I'll show you today what I would suggest a format, but it's up to you into whatever fits your your learning style best. Okay. All right, so we're gonna have four exams each Monday. The final the last week we have an exam on Monday and then we'll have the final exam on Thursday. The final exam will be an ACS um, exam. Um, meaning that it's a standardized exam. I We use it here. I think everybody, pretty much every university uses it, uses organic and general chemistry. Um, we use it here for assessing how students do against the national norms. Um, but it is a final exam, so I will curve it appropriately when we get to that time. So um, it will be totally comprehensive. Organic 1 and Organic 2. I've given those of you who didn't have access to the Canvas 220, um, 221 site, I've given you access to it. I think you just have to accept it, and then you'll have access to it. That we're at the university, we're technically in summer two hasn't ended yet. It ends on Friday. But in order for us to get five weeks in both this and general chemistry here, what we have to do is we have to extend 
the 221 class one week and extend the second semester one week or the third semester, the summer three one week. So summer three technically starts next Monday, but for this class it's today, just so you know. Um, so that's so that's why it's extended. And so the Canvas, I had to release the Canvas site this morning because it would not it it would automatically release next week. And if you're we're in here on Thursday of last week, I have to put your grades in today into the computer because I did not know where they changed the grade entry button to until this morning. So I haven't put the grades in yet, but I will do so. Okay. So we're using the Top Hat electronic book. Um, you can get access to that. Um, the directions are at the end of, or are on a, they are right here. So you can click on that. The, you can click on this to get you the, to figure out what the, um, the number is. It's, it's listed here for 36909. And you'll get access to the entire, um, entire chapters one through. Um, chapter 22 or 23. So you'll have access to the entire book. And you keep access to this electronic book as long as Top Hat's in business. So that's why I chose them as opposed to some of the other electronic books. Number one, this is cheaper. Um, if you want a paperback or a paper copy of a book, any book would work. I, I recommend sort of Wade because this kind of mimics Wade. But you can go to half, you can go to a half price bookstore and get any organic book for like less than twenty bucks. So instead of three hundred that it would normally cost, but you keep access to this. Many places they'll be they'll say, "Well, I'll give you access for like two years." This is allegedly forever, um, and so that's what one of the reasons why I'm using it. Okay. All right, so. I've given you a hard copy of the schedule because that's what you're going to need to really look at. The schedule will be in each folder under the reading assignment, but you have a hard copy so you can keep track of the problems you're doing, etc. And if the, the problems that you do in the chapter of Top Hat are grade on, graded on participation. And I think I've clicked all the buttons that will show you the correct answer, but I think you have unlimited tries. So if you have unlimited tries and it's by participation, if it doesn't show you the correct answer, just keep going until you find it. But that might be a question you want to ask in class. You might have said, I didn't get this. But we'll be doing problems so that, we'll, so that when you have problems, you'll ask. And we'll probably do a lot, we're gonna do a lot more group work. So I will break you up into groups every day, a different group. I'll randomize it. Okay, so any questions? If you have questions, you know, as I'm talking, you just have to yell and we will and I don't and I have to I have to pick up the printer for the, if I ask, I have cards that you, clicker cards, and I have the new clicker, clicker cards printed for people who don't have one, but I left them on the printer, so I will get them, and I'll show you how to use them as I ask questions. Okay. All right, so let's, we're going to do some review today. Um... We're going to do some review and also um, go through and look at some of the elect electrophilic reactions of alkenes. So that's where I that's where I ended up last week, and so that's what we're going to um, that's what we're going to look at. That's what your PowerPoint slides are on.
So just to go back, um, there's a couple things that we talked about with reactions of alkenes. When I'm doing a reaction of an alkene, I'm going to add HX to the alkene. So last week, um, and if you weren't here last week, that's fine. Last semester, whenever you took it, um, there are three questions we need to ask when we're adding something to a double bond. The first question we need to add is, what am I adding? So when we add HCl, HBr, HI, we're adding H and an X. We're adding H and a halogen. So that's the first question. As we go through the reagents, we will make a table of all the reagents that we have. We don't have very many reagents right now. But first thing is, what am I adding? If I add H plus H2O, I'm adding an H and an OH. If I add H plus and an alcohol, I'm adding an H and an OR group. So what am I adding? The second question is, how is it being added? So in other words, Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? So in this case, which there's a few, I think you have the, you have sort of the correct inversion here. I'm going to add H and Cl to the double bond. So there's two possible ways to add H and Cl. Uh, that to give basically products um, A and B here. So when I add H and X, H and Cl, I'm going to get these two possible products. The minute that I make more than one product, my next question is going to be which one is the major product? The major product is 51% or majority product. Um, if there were three products and they were you know, 33, 33, and 34, 34% would win. So that's the major product. If it's two, it's going to be whichever one has the higher percent or usually 51, 49. So when we look at this, um, I'm going to add the H and the X in both uh, possibilities. Then what is Markovnikov addition? Markovnikov addition says that you add the H to the alkene carbon with the most hydrogens attached. And there's a mechanistic reason for that. The mechanistic reason for that is that when I add the H, for instance, to carbon A, this pair of electrons, if I have an H+, plus, this pair of electrons in the double bond is going to be used to bond the H. So when I take that pair of electrons and bond the H plus to carbon A, that means that carbon B gets a plus charge. And down here, if I added the H to carbon B, that means carbon A would get a plus charge. And so looking at those two, the major product is going to be the one that comes from the most stable carbocation, which in this case is the lower one because it's tertiary. So I got a tertiary versus a primary carbocation. In this class, we don't write primary carbocations. We will later today in lab, if you're in lab. But carbocations cannot exist unless it's a high energy environment. And in solution, it's not a high energy environment. So this is the more stable carbocation, or the more stable intermediate. And so the more stable intermediate, then it's going to give you the major product, which in this case is going to be B. So that's the Markovnikov rule. Add the hydrogen to the carbon with the most hydrogens. We're broadening that, we're going to broaden that out today, and we're going to say add the electrophile to the carbon with the most hydrogens. For the same reason that if I add the electrophile to the carbon with the most hydrogens, 
I'm going to end up with a carbocation, a more stable carbocation. That's Markovnikov addition. So reactions either go by Markovnikov addition or anti-Markovnikov addition. And so question number two is, for every reagent, does it add Markovnikov, does it add anti-Markovnikov? Okay, so I need to know what am I adding, and am I adding it Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? So what am I adding, how am I adding it? And question three is, how am I adding it? How am I adding it in terms of the stereochemistry? Am I adding those two groups 100% cis, 100% trans, or 50-50? And so in this particular case, how am I adding it? Oh, by the, for those of you who haven't been in here before, I had this wheel that randomly chooses names. You remember? So when I'm adding my H and my X, am I adding them 50-50 cis-trans, 100% cis or 100% trans? Fifty-fifty. We agree with that. So it's going to be added fifty-fifty, and we need to know that because we're going to have to determine whether react. You're correct. Each reaction can either be stereo or regioselective, both or neither. So we we're not done with that. We're not done with classifying reagents. So if we go ahead here, here is our reasoning for HX addition, adding, forming the two different carbocations, and then the major carbocation is going to be the one that forms the major, the more stable one gives the major product. Now when we're looking at the stereo selectivity of this reaction, I'll define that in a minute. This is an ethyl group. I think you have the corrected ones. And this is a, or that, sorry, that's a propyl group. So when we're looking at stereo selectivity, if I, for the major product, if I added an H to carbon, in this case, add an H to carbon A because there's only one hydrogen there and then for carbon B there's no hydrogen. So what I have to remember about stereoselectivity is that when you add an H plus to the double bond you make a carbocation. So when you have a carbocation the chloride that's going to be the nucleophile can either add from the top or it can add from the bottom lobe because remember a carbocation has an FDP orbital. So the CL will either add from the top or the bottom. There's nothing preventing it from adding both ways. And so what it's going to do is it's going to add 50% of the time to the top, 50% of the time to the bottom. And if we work that out, that means that I'm going to make 50% of each of the two enantiomers. So when we look at whether this react, well, let's define a couple of terms here and go back and redefine them. And, I'm, and if I'm boring people from last week, that's great because you still remember it. But when we talk about reactions that produce two different stereoisomers, and in this case, it's producing two different enantiomers, when you f have the possibility of forming more than one possible enantiomer in a reaction, it could be what we call stereoselective, a stereoselective reaction. So, I'm going to sound like a broken record here, but we're going to break this up into two parts, selective and stereo. So what does it mean to be selective? Number one, for the reaction to be selective, you need more than one possible product. And those two products must be stereoisomers. What are our possible stereoisomers? Enantiomers, diastereomers, cis-trans isomers. So you have to form more than one possible 
isomer, stereo isomer. But then to be selective, you have to choose one as the major product. If you do not choose one as the major product, you're not selective. So there's two criteria for selectivity. You need to have more than one product, and you need to select one. If the products are 50-50, that's not selective. And in this case, if I go through this mechanism and add the chlorine to the top and add the chlorine to the bottom, I will end up with two enantiomers. So check, I've got two different stereoisomers. But because this is, in essence, the second step of SN1, and we learned in SN1 you always get a racemic mixture, you get a 50-50 mixture of those two enantiomers, and so therefore you didn't select. And so this reaction could not be stereoselective because it's not selecting a major reaction or major product. Now, what if it had? Well, stereo just means that the two products are stereoisomers. So that's so it's really the selective part that's critical. When will you get a stereoselective reaction? And we'll get some today. You'll get a stereoselective reaction when, well, you'll have the possibility of getting a stereoselective reaction if you add the groups either 100% cis or 100% trans. So that's when the reaction could be stereoselective if you are adding the two groups 100% cis or 100% trans. Now, I'm saying possible because it is possible that it won't be stereoselective. And so, when wouldn't it be stereoselective? Um, typically, it will not be stereoselective if we only make one chiral center in the molecule. If we make a product with just one chiral center, the reaction will not be stereoselective. And the reason for that is that the basic rule in making chiral molecules, making one in, anti in a higher percentage than another, is to make a chiral product, you need to use a chiral reagent. And so HCl and the double bond are not chiral. And, and I don't mean cis or trans. Cis or trans doesn't count for chirality. Only chiral centers, only carbons with four different groups attached, count as chiral. So in this case, this reaction, even if it would have made, well, it can't make one. If it would have made one over the other, it would be stereoselective. But in general, when we only make one chiral center, it will not be stereoselective. If we make no chiral centers, it's not even close to being stereoselective. So for a reaction to be stereoselective, it's going to need to make two chiral centers. Because if you make two chiral centers, then the, 50, then the cis and trans leads to diastereomers, and that we can actually form one over the other. But in antimers, we cannot. So that's the stereoselective reaction, just to remind you of that, or if you haven't seen that. So let me go back. There's also this thing called regioselective. The difference between stereoselective and regioselective is that the regioselective, your product, your major product, is one of several possible structural isomers. So when you add, for instance, HCl to a double bond, Markovnikov and anti-Markovnikov, you have the possibility of forming two different structural isomers. How do you know things are structural isomers? They have different structures, but the easiest way to determine if two things are structural isomers is that they have different they have different IUPAC names. So these two molecules right here are structural isomers because they have different names. 
So selectivity part of this is the same. You gotta form two different products and then you have to select one over the other. And if you do that, then the reaction is regioselective. So regioselectivity deals more with Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, and stereoselectivity deals with adding 50-50 or adding 100% cis and 100% trans. So in this case, adding HCl could be regioselective, but it will never be stereoselective. And it will never be stereoselective because a, you form a carbocation and so you're automatically going to get 50-50 addition. Okay. Let's do a new reaction. New from the standpoint of new. So, bromination. So, when I add Br2, to a double bond, I'm going to end up adding two Br's. Okay, so the first thing is, when we do bromination, what am I adding? I'm adding two Br's. How does this mechanism work? We'll get into the nitty-gritty details here, but think of it this way. I'm going to take the pair of electrons from the carbon-carbon double bond, and I'm going to use it to bond a bromine, and then at the same time, that bromine-bromine bond is going to break. So basically what I'm going to do is, I'm going to have a Br that will become a plus charge, and the other Br will become a negative. And the way that works is that as the bromine as the bromine molecule comes into the influence of the carbon carbon double bond it polarizes so that the bromine closest to the double bond becomes slightly positive the other bromine becomes slightly negative until the bromine bromine bond breaks and the br plus adds to the double bond but it, the net result is adding two brs so, bromine, since I'm doing bromination and I'm adding two BRs, could that reaction be regioselective? And the answer is no. Because the whole idea is for regioselectivity, if you add the groups this way and then you add the groups this way, you get two different products. Well, if I add two BRs this way and two BRs that way, I get the same product. So this reaction cannot be regio... It cannot, as it says here, cannot be regioselective. And that goes back to another general principle that sometimes it's easier to determine when the reaction cannot be regio or stereoselective versus when it can. So we use the it cannot be as kind of a screening tool. So reactions cannot be regioselective if the double bond is symmetrical or the reagent symmetrical. So if you add HCl to a double bond that's symmetrical, doesn't matter which way you add the HCl. And so in this case it's the bromine that's symmetrical. So this reaction cannot be regioselective. Could it be stereoselective? Well, it could, it could be stereoselective because we need to talk about the mechanism. So it turns out that the two bromines are always added trans across the double bond, 100% trans. So let me let's look at this reaction.
So if I add my Br2, I'm going to take my double bond and react it with the bromine, to, with one bromine, so the Br plus, and then the other bromine is going to leave as a Br minus. So in essence, what I just did was I added a Br plus to this molecule. Now I could say, well, you know, I've got carbons A and B. Should I add the bromine to carbon A and make B a carbocation? Should I add the bromine to carbon B and make A a carbocation? And the answer is it's going to add to both carbons at the same time. Now hydrogen is small. Hydrogen has to choose a carbon to add to. But bromine is huge. And so what bromine can do is bromine can actually sit in between the two carbons. And you might say, well, why does the bromine want to do that? And it's not really a question of whether the bromine wants to sit between the two carbons. It's, a, it's that the carbons wants the bromine to sit between the two carbons. Because if the bromine gets attached to one carbon or the other, the other carbon's got to take a full-blown positive charge. It would be better if the carbons could share that positive charge. And so when the bromine sits over the carbons, each of those carbons gets some of the charge. In essence, what I'm adding here is a Br plus to a double bond, which means overall then this species has to have a plus one charge. And so instead of one of the carbons taking the full brunt, of, it's going to take and it's going to share it. So the bromine is actually going to bridge. And this is different than if when we did a hydride or a methyl shift, when we shifted the hydrogen from one carbon to another, in the transition state, the hydrogen would be in between. But that was a high energy transition state that didn't really exist for much more than a split second. This is an intermediate that can last a little bit longer. And so when the bromine sits on both of those carbons, I'm going to end up with an intermediate, not a transition state. Why is this important? Because when the second bromine comes in and adds the Br minus, it can't add from the top. So there's an element of this reaction that is SN2-like in terms of the bromine having to add basically from the back side. But in this case, what it means is the bromine is going to add from underneath. And I haven't put carbon groups on the carbon yet. We'll work our way to that. So let's say the bromine Br- minus comes and adds to this carbon, the, the carbon on the left. Then that pair of electrons is going to go to the bromine, and it's going to shift over so that Basically, the carbon, the Br minus that added, and the Br plus that added originally, because this goes through a triangular intermediate, the bromine has to add underneath. And so this has to be 100% trans. So that's what, the that's what the mechanism will look like. And will you have to write the mechanism for this? Yes. Will you have to write any transition states? Well, because with the bro because the brom the and I didn't name this. This is called a bromonium. In the bromonium ion, because there's partial bonds, if we tried to write a transition state with more partial bonds, it's going to be a mess. So we're actually not going to write transition states for this.
And if we were to write the mechanism, it would look like this. So the bromonium ion basically is triangular intermediate. And whenever you have a triangular intermediate, you're always going to have the two groups adding 100% trans because they have to add from underneath. Now, where are we going to see this? We're going to see this stereochemistry whenever we start with a double bond that, first of all, is going to be unsymmetrical. But even, an, even a symmetrical alkene could be stereoselective. So right now we said this cannot be regioselective because I'm adding two bromines. How about stereoselectivity? Well, let's start with cyclohexene. And let's add Br2 to it. So let's write the two possible products. And to write the two possible products, we write the molecule without the double bond. What am I adding to the double bond? Question number one. How many? Two BRs. Okay. BR, BR. BR, BR. Ratio selective? No. There's no Markovnikov addition here. Now, there will be if I added something other than that second BR. And I wouldn't raise that point if we're not going to do that next. So right now, with the two BRs, it's not regioselective, but is it stereoselective? So how can I, in theory, how can I add the two BRs? I could add the two BRs 100% cis and 100% trans. Does it matter? Whether they're both bold or both dashed wedges, no. Does it matter whether there's a bold dashed or a dashed bold, as long as they're opposite? That's 100% trans addition. Now, here's where the stereoselectivity, as it was when previously talked about this, here's the difficulty with stereoselective. When they came up with the term selective, selective covers 5149 all the way up to 100 to 0. There is no term for a reaction that goes 100 to 0. Well, there is a term. It's selective. So in this case, you might say, but that product on the right, well, sorry, the product on the left isn't possible. Or it's better to say that product on the left isn't formed. Is it possible? Yes. Is it formed? No. So when we talk about selectivity, we're talking about the possible products, the theoretically possible products. For regioselectivity, it's adding the two groups like this and adding the two groups like that, opposite. For stereoselectivity, it's adding the two groups cis and adding the two groups trans. It doesn't matter whether the reaction forms at 100, 0, or 5149. So in this case, the fact that this possible product is formed means that did I make two stereoisomeric products that are different? Are these two products different stereoisomers? The choice is yes or no. Alex. Okay. Do you want to offer what kind of stereoisomers they are?
We agree with that? That they're diastereomers? Okay. Anybody disagree with that? Anybody don't know? Top carbon has what configuration? Top carbon in both molecules has the same configuration. The bottom carbon has the opposite configuration because I switched the H and the BR. So if the top carbon has the same configuration and the bottom carbon has the opposite configuration, what are those molecules? They're diastereomers. All right, is that a pair of stereoisomers? It most definitely is. So do I have two possible stereoisomers to choose from? Yes. Did I? Did I select one of one as the major product? Yes. And again, for selectivity, it doesn't matter if it's 100% to zero. I selected a major product. So in this case, this reaction is stereoselective. But it is not regioselective. Now, that's great. What about this molecule? What about this reaction is different than the one we did before with the carbocation? Well, if you only form one chiral center, the reaction is not going to be serious. But how many chiral centers did I form here? Brandon. How many chiral centers? Two. Do we agree with that? So there's a chiral center here and a chiral center there. So when will a reaction not be stereoselective? Couple of couple of situations. If you add 50-50, won't be stereoselective. If you don't, if you add 100% cis or 100% trans, it might be stereoselective, but it will be stereoselective then if you have two or more chiral cells. So your product has to generate two chiral centers to be stereoselective. So the two criteria for stereoselectivity are, number one, 100% cis or 100% trans. And number two, that you must have two chiral centers. You have to form two chiral centers. And if those two criteria are fulfilled, you're going to be stereoselective. If either one of those two is not fulfilled, you won't be stereoselective. So that's bromination. No? Good question. So of those three atoms, there is an overall positive charge. You could, you could say, and some people will write the delta positive charge on the bromine, but that bromine doesn't want anything to do with the positive charge, right? So that's why it's shoving all that positive charge down to the carbons, because they're better, they're better equipped to take the positive charge meaning that they're more electropositive or less electronegative than the bromine. So you may see in some of the answer keys that I write or on old, some of the older exams, you may see that I do have a delta positive charge on it. It probably shouldn't be there, but it's okay if it is. 
because it's these two positive charges that we're going to have to deal with. Right, so if we're adding, if we're doing bromination, we're adding two BRs. That's not Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov, 100% trans. And then we have to take each individual reaction because if it doesn't generate two chiral centers, it's not stereoselective. So, like in the book, they say bromination, stereoselective. But it's not always. Sometimes it might be, sometimes it might not. It's going to be up to each individual reaction. How are we going to know? We fit those two criteria. So, this just kind of, see, there's the, there's the delta positive on the bromine. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's 25 years ago, so we can just eliminate it. If there is some, it's not going to be very much. And so the bromine bridges, and so there, here's a, Here's a sort of animation of our bromine. And so both of those carbons being delta positive, you can kind of see the triangular intermediate. The Br minus has to add from underneath. And right now, this, this will change in about 30 seconds, we don't care which carbon it adds to. Because I'm going to end up with two Brs. So it doesn't matter. Now, what if I added a different group? So you might say, what if I add Br2 and water, bromine water, to this double bond? Well, double bond and water will not react together. They're both nucleophiles. I need an electrophile to make this reaction work. So one of the bromines is going to add as the electrophile to the double bond. And so I'm going to have the same starting mechanism. I'm going to have my double bond come in, attack the double bond, attack the bromine, one of the bromines and then have the bromine bromine bond break to form Br minus. And so I'm going to end up with the same brom the same bromonium ion intermediate that I had before with the same delta positive charges on the carbons. But the problem in this case is that if I do this reaction in the presence of water, when the Br, when the double bond comes in and reacts with the, with the Br plus, before the Br minus had, had a chance to like go underneath and add. But now when I form this Br plus, because water is the solvent, I got a water molecule sitting there. And so if the water molecule is immediately sitting there, it's going to jump right in and add. And it's going to add to, in this case, I didn't specify the carbons. So it's going to add one to one or both of those carbons. We'll deal with the regioselectivity here in a moment. But let's just say, okay, the water is sitting there. It's going to go ahead and add to the carbon. And then the pair of electrons is going to go to the bromine so that on the carbon on the right, I added my water molecule. And remember, I added my whole water molecule to this. And so what's my last step of the mechanism going to be? 
break the OH bond. The pair of electrons moves towards the oxygen. I'm going to lose an H plus, which is going to pair up with my Br minus. And I'm going to net result. The net result is I'm going to end up adding a Br to one carbon and an OH to the other. And this is called a bromohydrin. So just a slight modification. Instead of doing it with just Br2, now I'm going to do it with Br2 and water. So what did I add across my double bond? A Br and an OH. So question number one, I added a Br and an OH. Now stereochemistry wise, how did the Br and the OH add? hundred percent trans. Why? Because I still went through my triangular bromonium ion. The second question though is going to be how did the BR and the OH add? Did they add Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? Well, you might say neither because I didn't add an H plus. Okay, let's broaden the term out. Let's broaden the terms out. Markovnikov addition is not only adding H plus to the carbon with the most H's, but it's also adding an electrophile to the carbon with the most H's. So in this case, is this reaction Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? Well, we got to determine that. So here's how we're going to determine that. There's the reaction that I'm going to do. So what intermediate am I going to form in this reaction? I'm going to form the bromonium ion. Now this reaction has to occur by this trend, this intermediate. It has to occur by the triangular intermediate because in the end product, the Br and the OH are going to be 100% trans. So if you're saying, well, let's just add the Br plus and make the carbocation. No, 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 you can't do that because you've got to form this triangular intermediate. So now you're going to play the role of the water molecule. Who are you going to attack and why? Are you going to attack carbon A? Or are you going to attack carbon B?
which would be okay so I got a vote for carbon A because it has the most substituents okay so we got an A most substituents what else Anna. So I got to vote for B less steric hindrance. So A, because there's a more stable carbocation. Well, that's a good question. So I don't see a full-blown delta, po or I don't see a full-blown positive charge on here. Do you want to amend your answer? Well, this is the intermediate, so there's already a delta positive charge on there. But more stable carbocation would also mean, in terms of that delta positive charge, what would that mean? Well, it can't be full-blown positive charge, but between A and B, could they have different amounts of delta positive charge? They could, and so which one would have the most delta positive charge? Do we agree, A? Why? And this is what you're when you're saying the more stable carbocation. Since there is no full-blown positive charge, then let's interpret that in terms of delta positive charge. So would A then have the most delta positive charge? Why did you say it would be the more stable carbocation to begin with? Okay, so if I shift the BR over, if I shift the BR over, what kind of, what kind of carbocation does C look like? If, carb, if carbon C, if I shifted B over and made it a full-blown carbocation, what kind would it be? Tertiary, secondary, or primary? A looks like a tertiary carbocation. I'm going to put that in quotes because it's not a complete tertiary carbocation. What does B look like? Primary. Again, I'm going to put that in quotes. So did you form a... So what is the difference here where there's a tertiary carbocation versus potentially a primary carbocation. Everybody completely confused. Remember the goal is I'm at where am I going to add the water to A or B? It looks to me like I have two conflicting answers. A, because 
it would in theory have more delta positive charge because it's a more substituted carbon which would make it a more stable carbocation if it was left to itself. But it can't be left to itself because I've got to bridge the bromine. And then I have B which says that water would add to B because it's less, it's less sterically hindered. So I've got two sets of reasons here. So what do we think? A or B? Count of three. A, B. Until I get till I run the printer and get cards. So is it do you think it's gonna to add to A, B, or I guess this means both. And this means I don't know. So A, B, both, don't know. All right? One, two, three. So it's like an even split between one and two. And a few fours thrown in. Two perfectly good reasons, right? Two perfectly valid reasons. Now, what would A, if, if A happens, how would you classify the mechanism of this reaction? SN1 or SN2? SN? SN? So whenever, so when we were doing SN1s, what, re, what halides reacted the fastest in SN1? Primary or tertiaries? Tertiaries did. Why? Because tertiaries formed the most stable carbocation. Primaries didn't because you can't write a primary carbocation. So when we're looking at the stability of the carbocation, we're saying, okay, this is an SN1 mechanism. When we're looking at steric hindrance, what kind of mechanism is that? That's SN2. So in this reaction, we have SN1 versus SN2. So the next question is, what's the mechanism of this reaction? Could be. And here's why it could be. Because if I'm choosing to react at one carbon over another because one has the greater delta positive charge, then in essence it's reacting as an SN1. So in other words, if charge is my consideration and not sterics, it would be SN1. And I'll even add SN1-like. Because this clearly has some SN2 characteristic to it, right? Because I'm not making a racemic mixture here. That water is going to attack from the backside, whether it adds to one carbon or another. So it has an SN2 characteristic. So I'm not talking really about stereochemistry here. I'm talking about regioselectivity. So the regiochemistry, whether it adds to A or B. So the water adding to A or B, what's going to govern its reaction? Sterics or charge?
you said that very quickly. Right, we're talking about the delta positive. So you said charge drives us, that the water is driven by charge. Do you have a reason why? Can somebody help her out, Anna? It is really polar. Brandon, do you have your hand up? Polar? It is about the water. And yes, water is very polar. Yep. Water is. Why? True statement. Water will be attracted to the carbon with the most positive charge. Why? What kind of it's a what kind of nucleophile? It's what kind of nucleophile? It's a weak nucleophile. Because water is a weak nucleophile. So if we go back to de when we're determining SN1, SN2, weak nucleophiles can only do SN1. Why? Because they're so weak that they can only react with a carbocation. Now, in this case, you're saying, but there's not really a true carbocation. Okay. If the water's going to react, it's going to have to react with the carbon with the most delta positive charge. Even though water's electron rich, it's not, it's like middle class electron rich. Right? It doesn't have a full bump positive charge or negative charge. So it has to donate to the carbon that's most electron poor. And so which one of those two carbons is it going to be? It's going to be A because A is the most substituted. A is going to have more delta positive charge. And if I had to choose between adding the bromine to A or B, bromine would add to A or B, bromine would add to B, leaving A as a carbocation. But that's not the mechanism. The mechanism is the bridge. So this whole exercise here, is basically about how do we interpret Markovnikov addition with a triangle, with a triangular intermediate? How do we look at Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov in the triangle? And what it boils down to is the bromine is going to end up on the carbon with the most hydrogens. And the nucleophile, whether it's strong or weak, actually, is going to end up adding to the carbon with the most substituents. Why? Because that's going to be the carbon with the most delta positive charge. So the water is definitely going to add to carbon A to make that bromonium ion. So while this isn't a true SN1 reaction from the standpoint of the stereochemistry, whenever we make a triangular intermediate where each of the two carbons has a full-blown positive charge, that re whatever the nucleophile is is going to add to the most substituted carbon. It's going to add to the carbon with the most delta positive charge. Does that make sense? Yes, no. 
And why did I spend so much time on this? Because this is the first of three times that we're going to use a triangle. All I'm going to do is change the BR with something else. But whenever overall this has a positive one charge, whenever I add a BR plus or I'm going to add H plus to an epoxide or I'm going to add a mercury ion, whenever I add that and that triangle has an overall positive one, the nucleophile will always add to the carbon that has the greatest delta positive charge and that carbon will always be the one that's most substituted. So, bromohydrin formation. What am I adding? A BR and an OH. How am I adding it? I'm adding it Markovnikov from the standpoint that the BR plus will add to the carbon with the most hydrogens. So now I broaden out my definition of Markovnikov addition to say, you know what? Any electrophile that ends up on the carbon with the most hydrogens, that's Markovnikov addition. So that's how we make a bromohydrin. You're kind of okay with that? So then what we need to do is we need to put in a problem and say, okay, what's the major product of the reaction? But those are my three things. BROH, Markovnikov, 100% trans. Then is that reaction regio or stereoselective? Alright, so we'll take a five minute break here, which I usually try and do sometime in this time frame. So you can decompress a little bit. I don't think we've reached the five to seven item limit. So we'll start back up again at like a little bit after 25 after. Okay, so let let me ask a, let me show you an example here of looking at the bromonium ion stability. So here are two here are two bromonium ions that I could make draw on the computer and then I could put them in virtual reality, which we may play around with as the semester goes. Um, we have a system that the computer science students built for us as part of their senior capstone where if we have the XYZ coordinates of atoms, it'll put it in virtual reality with the headset, which is sort of become more difficult given there are now cordless headsets, of which I now have two in my office, but I gotta figure out how to how to make these work. So the best I can do is take a video of what you see. We have gamers to thank for that. Because they want to record all their super life exciting adventures in VR. So the first one I'm gonna, the first one is to add the BR is to add the BR to this symmetrical alkene and then over here to add it to the molecule I just made. So notice that if I add the BR to the symmetrical one and I walk up to it, you can see that the bromine kind of sits perfectly in the middle. And I'm going to move it around on that.
that I made with myself over to look at it. So you can see the bromine sitting there perfectly in the middle with this one. So that had two methyl groups on each side of the double bond. So. Now, the one on the right is the one that we just did. And notice that the bromine is not sitting in the middle. It's not a perfect triangle. It's not a whatever kind of triangle that is. It's a tilted triangle. So the bromine is actually sitting more over the carbon with the CH2 than it is the carbon with the two methyl groups. So my question is, why does the one on the right look the way that it is? Why is the bromine sitting more over the CH2 than it is the C with the two methyl groups? This isn't a random question, right? This has to do with what we just talked about. Let's see, can I make it? No, nope, I can't make it. I can't make it big. Any ideas? Well, we already, said, we already said, where is the bromine going to end up in this reaction? Since it's the, since it's the electrophile, it's going to end up on the carbon with the most hydrogen. So it kind of looks like it's already there, right? But yet I haven't added anything to it. And when I wrote it on paper, I showed the bromine sitting in between the two equally. They're not. It's not. It's on the one on the right. Is there anything also different about those two carbons? It's kind of hard to see here, but if you look at this carbon, if you look at the carbon with the two methyl groups, it looks to me like those three, these three methyl groups attached, or these three carbons attached to that one, it looks like they're planar. Whereas over here, the two hydrogens, this doesn't look planar. It looks more sp3-ish, and the carbon with the two methyl groups looks sp2-ish. Why would the carbon with the two methyls look more sp2-ish? What does sp2 mean? Yeah. So why would a carbon be trigonal planar? All valid statements, but like five out of ten. Why did I say question? What did we say about the carbon with the methyl groups? What does it have? More, more partial positive. In this case, it almost looks like that carbon. What's special about a carbon being sp2 hybridized? When is it sp2 hybridized? In an intermediate with a positive charge. When it is a C 
see, I don't think, can I write on this? I can. I don't want to, but there's my sp2 hybridized carbon. What am I missing from it? What kind of charge does it have? A positive charge. So let's say it was a carbocation. What am I missing? What does a carbocation, carbocation have? It's got a positive charge, but what else does it have that's missing from this diagram? An empty p orbital. That's what's making it sp2 hybridized. So in this case, I thought this would make a good case study, but apparently I need to put more information to build up to the final answer. But so in this case, does the bromine need to be closer to that carbo to that carbon? It doesn't because that carbon is pretty much looks like a carbocation. Right? And that's what you said at the beginning, Megan. It was it's a carbocation, but it's not. Because that bromine is still partially attached to it. If this was a full blown carbocation, you would add the water to both sides and you would make basically both 100 or 50 50 cis and trans. So that bromine is at least still bonded to it. But it's not bonded very much. Why? Because that carbon has got two methyl groups on it. It can take a majority of the positive charge. But what about the carbon with the two hydrogens? Well, it would be a primary carbocation, and it, that's not going to be happy. So the bromine kind of moves over and makes that carbon look tetrahedral. So that that carbon has very little of the charge. And if it has very little of the charge, it's going to look more sp3 than sp2. So in reality, when these systems are um, unsymmetrical, the bromine doesn't sit in the middle. It sits more to the side of the carbon with the most hydrogens because it's got a, that carbon can't handle much positive charge. And that's kind of what this is showing. And I got this by doing some calculations, which if you're in lab, you'll see later on. But you see these kinds of pictures in the book. They get them from calculations as well. And they're pretty decent calculations, I would imagine. So it's kind of a realistic model of what happens. When you've got the same carbocation on both sides, the bromine will sit in the middle. But if not, it'll shift over. So this is just further evidence of the fact that that carbon that's more substituted has more positive charge because it looks more sp2-like. And to look more sp2-like, carbocations, that means it's more carbocation. -like. And the carbon with the CH2 looks more non-sp2-like or sp3-like. So, it, so that's what the intermediate should really look like. Is it partially on its way to forming the final product? Yes. But if that bromine completely broke away, the other bromine couldn't come in and add. It could come in and add to both sides, and that's not the case. I guess this problem needs a little bit of work. What it needs is it needs a 3D model, which is why I had a 3D printer on my desk the other for the last two weeks and haven't gotten a chance to print this out in 3D in a 3D model, which you could look at in your hands. We're going to get to that eventually too. Does that make sense? So this is reinforcing the idea of what we just saw. Carbocation in the in the bromonium ion, any intermediate with a triangular or any reaction with a triangular intermediate, the carbon that's most substituted is going to look is going to look more like carbocation, like a traditional one. It's going to have more delta positive charge. But it's still a triangle because these things add 100% trans. If it didn't, it would be 
or if it didn't, it would be less than 100%, which it's not. Right, does that make sense? Okay. So, let's go back. I kind of took these a little bit out of order in the way that they are in the book, but the, the, the three reactions that we're going to talk about here go together because they all involve triangles. So the next reaction of, next addition of, to a double bond is mercuration demercuration, in which I'm going to add an H and an OH. Okay. So in the mercuration demercuration, I'm going to, let's see, do I have a blank slide here? because I'm just going to write it out by hand. Okay. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my double bond and I'm going to react it in a two-step reaction that's going to end up adding H and OH. So, first thing I'm going to add is mercury acetate. Now this is the way it's written, mercury OAC2. The AC stands for acetate, which is basically a deprotonated acetic acid, which is a C double, which is a C double bond O, two O's with the CH3. So this is a mercury two plus ion with two minus acetates. And so what's going to happen in this case is that the double bond is going to come in and add to the mercury and it's going to kick off one of the acetates. So right now the O- is sort of covalently, not covalently attached to the mercury. So when it comes in it's going to basically kick that off as an acetate. So I'm going to end up losing the OC double bond OCH3, I'm going to lose one of those, and now I'm going to end up with an HG with one acetate, which means HG2 plus, one minus, so I've got a plus charge overall. And that mercury is large enough to actually sit over both carbons. So this overall has a positive one charge, but the mercury is big enough to sit over both carbons, so what did I just make? I just made a triangular intermediate. Now the mercury acetate is replacing the Br+. plus. Right? And both of these carbons now are delta positively charged. Why did I do Br plus first? Because it's one atom. This is more complicated simply because now it's an Hg plus one with an acetate. Same principle though. Now I'm going to add water to this. Where's the water going to add? Well, in this case, I haven't written out the specific, the specific groups, but I'll go ahead and add the specific groups then. We'll use the same one we just did. See, two CH3s on the left and two H's on the right. Carbon A on the left, carbon B on the right. So where's the water going to add? Two carbon A. Because two 
It's got the larger delta positive charge because it's more more substitute. Right. Everybody should be shouting that at this point. So I'm going to bring my water in and then my mercury is going to slide over so that I'm going to have my oxonium ion and over here I'm going to have the mercury attached to the acetate and then the two H's. And then what's going to happen next? This is getting real tedious. Then next, what's going to happen? I'm going to lose the OH, I'm going to lose the H plus from the water. So I'm going to lose H plus. And now I will have added an OH to the most substituted carbon. And now I will have a mercury acetate attached to the right hand carbon, the less substituted. I could have gone back to my previous mechanism and erased the BR and written in HGO8C. It's exactly the same mechanism. How did the OH how did the mercury and the OH add? They added Markovnikov, if I consider the HG to be my electrophile, and they added 100% trans. So they added 100% trans here. All right, good thing we did the bromonium ion first. And I could put the mercury in the triangle and we could go through the, all that again in terms of writing the mechanism coming off the triangle of why the mercury added to carbon A. Now you might say, um, I think the notes said you added an H and an OH at the beginning. Right now I see how you added a mercury and an OH. So how do I replace the mercury with an H? So this is a two-step mechanism. The first reagent is mercury acetate. So then we make this mercury compound and then we do the second step. So all I'm going to do is just write that molecule again. So now what I need to do is I need to replace the mercury acetate with an H. But I need to do it so that the hydrogen ends up in exactly the same place as the mercury. So what reagent am I going to use? I'm going to use NaBH4, which is sodium borohydride. Now, the sodium is a counter ion. It's a spectator ion. BH4 is a BH4 with an overall negative charge. Boron is one of those few elements that is less electronegative than hydrogen. So each one of those H's has a delta minus charge. And an H minus is what we call a hydride ion. And a hydride ion is not only a good base, it's a good nucleophile. Although in this case what's going to happen is I'm just going to end up replacing the mercury with a hydrogen, but the hydrogen is going to go in exactly the same position as the original mercury. So when I make that molecule, I'm going to end up with the H in exactly the same position as the mercury ended, which means that that H is going to end up adding 100%. So the way this reaction is sometimes written is you'll see alkene, 
and then you'll see mercury acetate, number one, and then number two, then H, then sodium borohydride. So it's a two-step reaction. Nothing. So the H and the OH will end up then 100% trans. So overall, what was this reaction? If you add, if you take your alkene and you add to it mercury acetate, then sodium borohydride, you're going to end up with adding H and OH, question number one. How are they adding Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov? It's Markovnikov and stereochemistry wise 100% Because if you're going to say, well, it's a big deal. I already know how to add H and OH. I just add H plus and water. If you add H plus and water, you end up with a 50-50 stereochemistry. With this one, you add up with you add 100% trans. So in situations where I want to add the hydrogen, 100% trans, then I'm going to want to use this reaction. So could this be regioselective? Yeah, because it's got Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. Could it be stereoselective? It could be, because I'm adding 100% trans. The question is, in the reaction, did I make a product with two chiral centers? So all, the, all this tells you in terms of stereo-regioselectivity is, could it be regioselective? Yes, if it's Markovnikov or anti-Markovnikov. Stereoselective, yes, possibly if, because it's 100% trans. Yes? Um, for the first step, do you add mercury acetate and water acetate? You add the mercury with two acetates. And then what happens is the pair of electrons attacks the mercury and kicks off an acetate. So the acetate's leaving it. So this is a this is a two step process. So I can accomplish this reaction if I want to add H O H Markovnikov anti. And we'd have to go back to what we um, did earlier when we said. I want to add an H and an OH I want to add the H and the OH anti-Markovnikov and 100% cis what reagent would I use then? H plus H2O, water is 50-50. What was the anti-Markovnikov? It's got hydrogen peroxide in it. And what comes before that? BH3. That's hydroboration oxidation. 
So hydroboration oxidation was a way to add H and OH anti-Markovnikov 100% cis. Is there a way to add I guess what we're missing now is we're missing the anti-100% trans. I don't think we're going to have one of those. Okay, so there's three different ways to add H and OH. But the idea of the mercury is that it will add 100% trans, but it will add more public. Well, every reaction has its own set. So that's why we should probably, you should make a table saying, what am I adding? Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov, and then 100% cis, 100% trans, or 50-50. So that's, that's oxymercuration, demercuration is the name of that. And it would be used uh, never in the lab. I, I wouldn't use it. Um, a pharmaceutical company would, if they were smart, they wouldn't use it, right? Because mercury is a neurotoxin, right? The days of taking the mercury and playing with it with your fingers and stuff. That may have happened in the 50s and 60s, but it doesn't happen now. Now you break a mercury thermometer in a school and it's a, you know, it's a evacuation order for days as they sweep it all up. But mercury is, an, is a neurotoxin. So in, in Alice in Wonderland, there was the Mad Hatter. Why was he mad? Well, he wasn't angry. He wasn't mad angry. He was mad crazy. More likely mad neurological damage. Because what did hatters do in the day? Hatters made hats. And what did they use to make the hats, the brims of the hats, nice and stiff? Mercury. So what did they do? They took the mercury in their hands and they made the hats. And then after a while, they went mad. That's, that's the most colorful example I can give you. There used to be, used to be a long time ago, mercury was used, there was a mercury compound that was used as a preservative in vaccines. It was called thimisorol. And so it was a mercury compound that was used as a preservative in, in vaccines. It has not been used for probably 20 years or so. But I'm not going to get into the vaccine, anti-vaccine controversy, if there is one. Um, but one of the things that people would say is that, you know, it was toxic because it had mercury preservative in it. Back in the day, they, can't, they don't use that as a preservative anymore. But you still have issues of, you know, mercury. I, mercury used to be everywhere. Fillings in your teeth used to be mercury before they went to ceramic. So, but it is a neurotoxin, and if I was making a drug as, as a pharmaceutical company, if I was making a drug, I would have to show the FDA that I got every atom of mercury out of the drug before it would be ever, ever be approved. And we have really slow detection limits on mercury nowadays, but I don't think we can do every atom. And so nobody would mess with it. They, if they put in their steps, they'd have to eventually prove that they got all the mercury out, which would just be time-consuming, and it would be very costly. So you wouldn't use that step in, in a pharmaceutical synthesis. And I wouldn't use it in a lab because it's not very environmentally friendly. And if the mercury is attached to a <clears throat> carbon compound, it goes right, in, right through your skin and you die. And there have been people that have actually had like methylmercury poisoning in the lab and they've died. And it was a huge lawsuit in one of the California 
research universities because they had methylmercury. So, great reaction, we'll stick to paper. We won't do it in the lab. But, and, and a lot of these metal reactions that we're going to talk about, that's something we have to consider. You know, can we get all that metal back out of our compound if we're going to do a drug synthesis? Right, so that's mercuration, demercuration. Now, let me add. So, back to halo back to um, bromohydrins. What's a bromohydrin useful for? Not much. Um, except it is a way to make what's called an epoxide. So if I take my halo hydrin and I treat it with base, with hydroxide, what's going to happen is the hydroxide is going to deprotonate the alcohol. And it doesn't have to deprotonate it 100%, just a little bit. And so I'm going to make that alkoxide up. Now, because the OH and now O minus and bromine are set up to be 100% trans, this O minus is going to do a backside attack on that carbon and kick the bromine off. And when it does that, it's going to form a species where the oxygen is now covalently attached to both carbons. And this is called, in IUPAC real names, it's called an oxirane, but more commonly it's called an epoxide. So you can form an epoxide by using a bromohydrin. And that's probably one of the more useful things you can do with, with a bromohydrin. But then again, if I'm going to do this reaction, I've got to take the double bond, form the, um, form the bromohydrin, then form the oxirane or form the epoxide. And if I want to make an epoxide from a double bond, I have a way to do it in one step. So the only reason I'm showing you this is because you might, you know, you might say, what, what's, what good is a bromohydrin? And um, this is it. But it leads into, well, how would I do this react? How would I make the epoxide in one step from the double bond? And so what I would do is I would do this reaction. So if you want to take a double bond, and let's put some, let's put some groups in here. To make this interesting. So let's say I have transbutene and I react transbutene, I want to make the epoxide out of it. What I'm going to react it with is what's called a peroxy acid. going to react this with a peroxy acid. And so here's my peroxy acid. So what happens in the peroxy acid is that one of these oxygens in it is just going to plop itself right down on the double bond. So I'm going to end up then forming the epoxide in one step. Now, the, the, this reaction, there is no Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov. That term doesn't apply. Nor does stereoselectivity. Because in this case, if you can imagine that you have the double bond and the oxygen comes down and it adds to both carbons at once, which is what I meant by plopping down, if the oxygen forms the two bonds, at the same time, 
then the stereochemistry of the double bond is going to be preserved in that product. So that if they started out trans, when you make the epoxide, the two methyl groups are also going to be trans. So you can kind of think of a retention of stereochemistry here. If you start trans, you end trans. And that tells us that the mechanism doesn't add the oxygen to one carbon because there's, then there's opportunity for it to twist and all of that. So this is not stereoselectivity. This is called stereo specificity. This is a stereospecific reaction. And we kind of touched on this at the end of the first class. So what specificity means is that if you change the stereochemistry of the reactant, you will get a different stereochemistry of the product. And I think in the notes there's a more formal definition. But when you change the stereochemistry of the reactant, you get um, a different stereochemistry of the product. So it's a different focus. The focus is more on the reactant than the product. Per se. So in this case, if I change the stereochemistry of the alkene from trans to cis, the epoxide that I'd form would be cis. It would go from being trans to cis. We already know that, well, we already know another stereospecific reaction, although we didn't call it that. SN2 is a stereospecific reaction. If I change the chiral center from R to S, what happens to the product? It changes from S to R. So a stereospecific reaction could be an inversion, or it could be a retention. An inversion should probably be like opposite, right? Because going from cis to trans would be more opposite than inversion. So this is an example of a stereospecific reaction. And that's honestly what reactions, that's the most important part of organic chemistry as you move into biochemistry is stereospecificity. It's kind of like chiral, it's when we, it's when you look at chiral drugs. You know, if you, if you're making a drug and it has the possibility of an enantiomer form of it, you have to test to make sure that that both enantiomers either do what you want them to do, one does what you want it to do, but you want to make sure the other one doesn't have any side effects or counteract. So the thalidomide sedative in the 60s, two enantiomers, one sedative, second birth defects. So we can't have that drug sold as a racemic mixture. Now it's just sold as one. Hoping that when it gets in my stomach, it doesn't ras well, not me. But when it gets in your stomach, it doesn't racemize. Or else you're gonna have birth defect babies. And you gotta make sure if you're selling it that you have every single molecule of that other enantiomer out of the system which somehow they're able to do, because they, they're selling it again. So that's specificity. If all of the, what is the, the, the popular essay question, sort of, like if you, back to Alice in Wonderland, if you're gonna go through the mirror, that means everything is gonna become the mirror image. So what's she gonna eat? Because Glucose, we can only metabolize one enantiomer of glucose. The other enantiomer we can't, we can't metabolize. 
so there's an essay question like what what could she eat um, what what would you know would all of her enzymes work so the idea of one handedness versus another is important but this is an example where I'm making I'm changing the stereochemistry of the molecule overall not RNS but cis So that's stereospecificity. So we can make an epoxide. We will open up epoxides in a day to a week or so. And when I open up an epoxide, the first thing I'm going to do is protonate that ox. I'm going to protonate this oxygen. And I'm going to make an O with a plus charge and a triangle. The O is going to want to push the positive charge down to the carbon. And I'm going to get back to my triangular and immediate again. And I'm going to say, remember when we did this? And everybody's going to look at me like, no, no, I don't. So we've done two of the three triangles. The triangle, 100% trans. Square, 100% cis. That was the intermediate for the hydroboration oxidation. And the last reaction of the day. And I'm not even. And I'm not even moving at hyperspeed. Hydrogenation. Now notice that most of these reactions have a very specific name to them. So in hydrogenation, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to add H2 to the double bond. What am I adding? Two H's. Markovnikov, anti-Markovnikov? Irrelevant. Adding two of the same atoms. 100% cis or 100% trans? Well, what do I need to make this reaction go? I actually need a catalyst such as palladium or platinum. And I need that catalyst in order to make, in order to activate the hydrogen enough to add to the double bonds. So you'll see in the notes that my simple schematic is, here's the palladium surface. Hydrogen gas comes down and it adsorbs onto the surface of the palladium. And so that adsorb with a D as opposed to absorb with a B, which means it goes into the bulk material. The H sits on the palladium. And then my double bond comes in such that the hydrogens are both going to add at the same time. You could write the arrows looking like this. Right, the double bond breaking to form the hydrogen, then the hydrogen bond breaking to add to the carbon. Most of these surface reactions are really, their mechanisms are not necessarily well understood. But they're incredibly important because these types of metal surface reactions occur in refineries and all sorts of places. So the palladium is more or less my catalyst. But in the end, what happened? In the end, then, the two hydrogens added 100% cis. Could it be regioselective? No. Could it be stereoselective? Yes. Could be stereoselective if, when I do this reaction, I make a product with two chiral cycles. 
So hydrogenation is potentially a stereo specific stereo it says stereo specific in the book. No, it's stereo selective. It says mechanism, stereo specific. It should say mechanism, stereo selective, except who knows? Each reaction is different. And we will do more of those. Final, final thing about hydrogenation. You may come into contact with hydrogenated things. For instance, that is called a fatty acid. The longer the, there's different chain, different tails. If I take that and I make a triglyceride out of it, that is a fat or an oil. Depends. If it's a solid, it's a fat. If it's a liquid, it's an oil. It's the definitions are as simple as that. So there's lots of um, oils that you can get. You can get coconut oil, which is sort of a, I guess it's a fat because it's solid. But you could get vegetable oil that's a liquid. And if you have liquid vegetable oil and you want to turn it into a solid, what do you do? Because what happens is, is that things with double bonds in here tend not to pack really well, so they tend to be liquids. Whereas if they're completely alkane, then they tend to pack really well and become a, uh, become a solid. So in general, oils are what we would call unsaturated, because they have a double bond in there. And fats tend to be saturated because they have nothing but CC double or CC single bonds. So if you've heard about saturated fats, which I guess are evil, and they will kill you instantly. Whereas you have unsaturated oils, those are better. What do they do when they make Crisco? You know, the magic solid. They basically take an oil and they solidify it. How do they do that? They take and treat it with, hydro with hydrogen and palladium and they take that double bond and they convert it to a single or convert it to a single bond. But then you end up, if you only end up um, hydrogenating part of the double bonds, then you end up with partially hydrogenated fats and oils, right? And those are evil too. So if you've heard of those terms, that's how hydrogenation is, is um, applied to sort of the food chemistry here. And so you could literally take vegetable oil, put it in a container, put some palladium metal, add hydrogen to it and it will solidify because and that's how they make that's how they make Crisco and any pre Crisco I think it was called oleo because if you get really old cookbooks it, it'll say use like oleo and you're like what's oleo it's basically Crisco now again health health implications of this are another story but Hydrogenation, pretty straightforward. Do we have to know the mechanism of hydrogenation? No. Do we have to know the mechanism of the mercuration? Just the first part. All right, so that are all, those are all the topics for today. So I will put some videos on later on. But if you could go back, you can go back and watch this video because I record everything and I'll put it up online along with these notes. We'll also go in the folder for today. So if you don't think you wrote something down correctly, 
you can check my notes and maybe you did or didn't. Maybe I didn't write it down correctly. Um, but those will be up. And so what are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to do the list. So read through those. Try the problems in the book. And then tomorrow we'll start and we'll do a lot more problem solving tomorrow and less of me lecturing. If you have questions, always you know shoot me an email. Try and come and find me.